Hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time to hear my thoughts on the topic of digital transformation. My name is Nigel Thurlow, and I'm currently the CEO of the Flow Consortium, a group of international experts helping organizations like yours to evolve. I also created something called Scrum the Toyota Way while I was the chief of Agile for Toyota, and since leaving Toyota at the end of 2019, I have co-authored the Guide to the Flow System, a system I co-created which elevates lean and agile thinking into the age of complexity. The Flow System is a system of learning and understanding and is not another one-size-fits-all agile framework complete with a two-day course and a pretty certificate. And the guide at the time of recording this is now in 18 languages. So let's talk about transformation and that mythical beast, digital transformation. It seems that every consulting house and CEO editorial is extolling the virtues of a digital first strategy. Indeed, some commentators are going as far to say ignore digital at your peril and be left behind as a distant memory. Reading one such article published in October this year, I noticed some dire warnings the author gave. The first warning, you can't just be digital, you need to be digital first. But what does that even mean? Wasn't the last desktop refresh a digital transformation? Or what about your last tech uplift? Did DevOps bring about the transformation that differentiated you from all your competitors? I can just see customers shouting, hooray, for test-driven development as they buy a banana. Oh yeah, that CICD pipeline is so cool as they pull on a new t-shirt emblazoned with an infinity loop. Does an awesome big data technology platform matter more than fresh produce in your supermarkets? Sure, big data can tell you what folks are buying or not buying, and so can your existing systems. But are you really going to have Robbie the Robot greeting your shoppers, quizzing them all about the quality of their produce, or are you going to actually engage with your customers? Oh, an engagement doesn't mean an iPhone app. If your business is an online retailer, then of course digital technologies and how you ethically leverage them are critical to your success. But is this obsession to digitize your entire organization and its products and services essential to your survival? Or is it just the latest fad to extract your annual budgets? Y2K anyone? Every two to three years, the big consulting houses announce the latest critical evolution in business as they encourage investment in the latest technology stack or new trend as they seek to sustain their own reason to exist. But is all this just marketing guff? I've been around this IT stuff for some time, and I remember when just-in-time was the latest fad, as the West discovered how Toyota were making things, and decades later, many of you are still trying to get that right. Since then, there has been a continuous flow of evolutions in must-have tools that will transform your business, with a plethora of vendors lining up to leverage your corporate IT spend with the essential stack of products to enable you to achieve the stated outcomes. Let's first examine what they mean by digital transformation. The dictionary definition for the word transformation is the act or process of changing completely from one thing to another. Like you turn a cow into a pair of shoes. So if you're a bank that is truly transforming, we have to ask into what? A supermarket perhaps? Is this a scene from a movie like The Fly where we enter some form of transmat beam and emerge from some conversion process, like a butterfly emerging from a pupa? No, of course not. But who knows, we might get there one day when the AI assumes control and determines the value of humans is now limited. The problem is with the word transformation. Are you really just transforming or really just evolving? Or are you simply modernizing, if not just imitating and playing catch-up to your competitors? Thinking about digital transformation again, what that really is, is modernization. The process of adapting something to modern needs or habits. So as your customers' habits and needs are changing, 
so does the need for you to keep up to modernize the way you deliver value to them. Organizations are constantly in a state of flux, so are really evolving. That's the gradual development of something, a process of gradual change. When you adopt some new agile ways of working, you are transitioning as you move from approach or method A to approach or method B. But that's just the process of evolving anyway. To transform into something better is called metamorphosis. Like a caterpillar changes completely into something better. Do you fit that bill? So speaking bluntly, Digital transformation is simply modernization of your aging systems but by buying or building replacements to better serve your customers. But organizational modernization doesn't really sell billable hours as well, so let's call everything transformation. If an organization truly wants to become something new and even greater or better, then that's metamorphosis. I think I'll rebrand myself as an organizational metamorphosis consultant. Don't think it's that silly. Just give it a couple of years and the big five will be offering you something similar. But if you act quickly, I'll give you a discount as an early adopter. The key aspect of digital seems to be the trend to move your systems that are on premises into the cloud. <gasps> that sounds so cool even a bit spooky, doesn't it? The cloud. Do you mean we suspend our equipment from the sky? How could we even do that? Listen, the cloud is nothing new. Before IBM invented the madness that became the personal computer, all IT systems were host-based. Yes, that's the old word for the cloud. Host-based means centralized computing. We had centralized servers called mainframes that sat remotely from the people using them, who accessed them using something known back then as a dumb terminal, a device with no computing capability, and if you're as old as me, you used to call them a VDU. I'm sorry for the young folks, a visual display unit. You could even get a job as a VDU operator. Then IBM gave mere mortals computing capability with the invention of the personal computer, and we moved to distributed computing where all our data and applications lived wherever the user had their PC. Oh, and of course, we still use mainframes today despite the doomsayers predicting their demise years ago. Think about that as you hear the same end of world predictions if you don't get on this digital first bandwagon. Microsoft then came along and created remote desktop computing reversing the trend back to where we again had everything centralized on a server and users connecting using something we called a thin client. It wasn't so great to be honest, so Citrix took the tech and made it workable, well, more or less. So the concept of the cloud, this invisible mysterious land where magical computing lives, connected by fiber optics and other forms of technical wizardry, has been around for decades. We just decided to rebrand it and to resell it to you as something new. Indeed, Cisco was selling the concept of clouds 20 years ago. The cloud is just a cool way of saying remote data center. Sure, the tech has improved with things like containerization and serverless computing, and of course, the speed of communications. But the basic concept is just the same. Put all your computing power in a central location and provide remote access to it. Upgrades and support are centralized, so the cost is lower, and support is easier to perform. I used to be the European IT director for a company in the early 2000s set up to sell remote desktop computing to businesses. And if the bandwidth had been up to the, to the job and Microsoft's platform a little more stable, we might have achieved what we seem to be being sold now. The key difference for you is now going to be vendor lock-in and the rapidly increasing costs of mediating, processing and data transfer, something IBM mastered on the mainframe and mid-range systems years ago. Anybody remember MIPS? And I bet you're all being told it'll be cheaper. The role of the CISO has of course emerged with this trend for cloud-centric computing. Now we store everything at a reliable, hmm, 
third party, we find ourselves having to invest vast budgets just to make it difficult for anyone to use, just in case bad people find a way to access our systems. Progress indeed. Add your disaster recovery approach, maybe two vendors or cloud agnostic, and I bet that's going to be cheap as well. I wonder six or seven years out from now if we'll all be rolling back to on-prem, just like offshore development is trending back onshore with reshoring. I guess time will tell. So if digital isn't just cloud, what exactly is it? Our author adds to their first warning by saying we must practice mindful design. This is the antithesis of what most of you are doing now, which is jamming the airwaves with a constant barrage of marketing ads, emails, texts, and robocalls. Their words. It's also an oxymoron to what you are being sold, which is primary focus and reliance on big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to manipulate people's buying habits and their decision making. What mindful design is really about is finding and meeting unarticulated need. That's discovering what your customers need before they know they need it. The iPhone that started the smartphone revolution was an articulated need. Apparently no one would ever buy a phone without a real keypad. Being more holistic in your products and services and focusing on human-centered design, but please don't go turning design thinking into yet another methodology or framework. That's the antithesis, again, of human-centered design, a process of emergence and discovery and not a linear, predictable approach. In the mid-90s, the late Clayton Christensen published a work on what's called disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market leading firms, products and alliances. It also disrupts the notion that firms fail because they don't keep up with technology. Something you are told endlessly by those sales reps trying to close that special end of quarter deal or better still the end of year deal with a once in lifetime pricing. If you don't transform to digital, you will fail. You must chase technology or die. I've heard this for decades and it's still a load of nonsense. Christensen showed that good firms are usually aware of innovations, but their current business environment prevents them from pursuing those innovations when they first arrive. Often this is because they are not seen as profitable enough at first because their development can take scarce resources away from that what's called sustaining innovations that are needed to compete against the current competition. In Christensen's terms, a firm's existing value networks place insufficient value on the disruptive innovation to allow its pursuit by that firm. You tend to ignore your people and their ideas while you stick to your annual plan, or worse still, some nonsensical notion known as the five-year plan. Another trend I've observed is patent funds where you hold some 24-hour event where everyone submits their ideas. You then patent them, or uh, patent them if you prefer, and then they're shelved for some indeterminate amount of time denying the original author both the ownership and the creative resources to bring it to realization. I created a simple 2x2 visual to help you see where you are now and where you might want to go, as well as where you should be focusing your investments. Are you disrupting the market with innovations and creating customers out of thin air? Are you perhaps a disrupted imitator? Or should you be content in the imitator or commodity space and leave innovation to the innovators? My own interpretation of Christensen's work is innovation is not disruptive in and by itself. Disruption is creating new sales with existing customers in an established market by disrupting the incumbent companies where they believe the market is tapped out. Tesla showed us how to do this. Commentators of Christensen's work disagree that Tesla were a truly disruptive innovator, but they have created customers where none existed and they have certainly disrupted the established and incumbent players, and they were a new entrant into the space. Did they innovate or just evolve the technology? 
Electric cars have been around since the 1800s, as of hybrids. The authors did say disruption describes a process where a smaller company with fewer resources is able to successfully challenge established incumbent business, and Tesla certainly meet that criteria. I categorise these types of organisations as exploiting. Despite all the observers that predict an end to their rise, the trend is still upward and Tesla is still performing. In fact, when you look beneath the surface, Tesla is not a car company at all. They're an energy company. So watch out if you're a fossil fuel based industry as Elon is coming. The key is to understand unarticulated need and then to exploit that through innovation and demand creation. The purveyors of digital tools will of course convince you that the only way to do that is buying their platforms and systems. When you allow these entrants to enter your space, you become a disrupted imitator. Are you constantly chasing others for market share? Or through acquiring those upstarts who challenge your market dominance? Or are you paying for the technology to enable you to compete? I classify you as responding, and in doing so, you are living in a high-risk and high-cost domain. Unless you can become the disruptor, you will remain the disrupted, and long may you survive. Moving to the imitators, the imitator is typically competing on price. I place Walmart here, and probably to many people's surprise, Apple. Here we find own brand or white label products that imitate the famous brand names as well as growth through mergers and acquisitions to eliminate the competition and to control markets. I categorise them as sustaining. Price set tends to be a key differentiator along with supply and choice. Do you have everything I want in one place at a price I'm willing to pay? Now stores such as Whole Foods offer a better quality on many items but typically at a premium price. Choice, not disruption. Choice, not innovation. Looking at Apple, I also see them as a commodity company. When Steve Jobs stood on stage and triggered the collapse of Nokia five years to the date of his iPhone unveiling, he was truly disruptive and innovative. He took on the company that had 52% of the global cell phone market and decimated them. He also bought us key innovations such as a touch keypad, with gestures and many more. Apple would not be the Apple of today without the iPhone. Nowadays we see them chasing others, imitating the competition and clinging to market share. Now there is nothing wrong with being an imitator. If you're making house bricks and you have a demand and you meet supply, you're probably content. The same is true for grocery stores. After all, you can't improve a banana that much. Apple, like others, have created a connected ecosystem that sustains their user base, but that is what was referred to as sustaining innovation and not disruptive innovation. If you truly want to be a disruptive innovator, you're going to have to look beyond harvesting data and cutting staff to safeguard profits. Our final space is reserved for the innovator. Here we find those struggling inventors and others in research and development pioneering new ideas. Are they disruptive? Not yet, and they may, not, may never be based on our understanding of the definitions. Innovators are seeking to market new ideas through the development of new products and into new markets. They may be attractive to investors or venture capitalist groups and are often takeover targets as their ideas evolve. You'll often find them pitching their ideas on Dragon's Den or the USA equivalent Shark Tank. They'll also hang out on Kickstarter and Indiegogo or similar platforms, and I categorise them as evolving. If you are an innovator, you may desire and aspire to become a disruptive innovator, and this may well be your ticket to fame and riches. You may be content to invent and evolve and sell. You may be working inside an R&D department refining and evolving products. But unless you can innovate in a disruptive way, this will remain evolution, not revolution. Just a note on innovation versus invention. Invention can be defined as the creation of a product or introduction of a process for the first time, whereas innovation occurs if someone improves on 
or makes a significant contribution to an existing product, process or service. Tesla is again a prime example of this. Be careful though, simple evolution of a product is not necessarily innovation. Extending the life of a battery is not really innovation. Adding pumpkin seeds to it, a completely made up idea in case you were wondering, to extend battery life is, in a, is innovation. In the case of the pumpkin seeds, that would also be something we call exaptation, a repurposing of something for a purpose it was never intended to serve, like taking radar to create microwave ovens. Our digital first author continues their warnings by reminding us we must understand individual customer mindsets and integrate qualitative and quantitative data to engage with people in more effective and inclusive ways. Going on to add that many companies use customer data to validate hypotheses and to identify patterns of customer behavior that allow them to hone their products, services, or strategy. The question is posed, however, how many of you are using that data to create, to create individually personalized interactions between the organization and the customer? And the answer, very few. In 1946, at the cessation of hostilities, a struggling automotive company in Japan coined the customer first adage, and since then, Toyota have continued to place the customer at the center of their universe. Many more companies are now talking about customer centricity, and this is apparently a new way of thinking. Customer first is defined by Toyota as the principle of considering the need and desires of the customer when determining direction or strategy. It's about delivering the highest quality at the lowest cost in the shortest lead time. And if any of you are lean thinkers, this is something that should be resonating with you. The, cost, the concept of customer first, or if you prefer that trending phrase, customer centricity, is again nothing new. It's been recycled by consultants. The phrase, the customer is always right, dates back to the late 1800s when the department store owner in Chicago, Marshall Field, coined the phrase, assume that the customer is right until it's plain beyond all question, he is not. The phrase was later paraphrased by Harry Selfridge, Selfridge is in London, who used to work for Marshall Field, and he paraphrased it as the customer is always right. Many of the flexible refund practices of today owe their beginnings to Field and Selfridge. A modern interpretation of innovation is responding to the customer's needs rapidly before your competition steals the opportunity. That's that unarticulated need again, and finding that disruptive innovation or product before the competition does. Last year, chief executives from the Business Roundtable recognized this when they declared shareholder value is no longer everything and outlined the four key principles to transform their businesses. Oh, there's that word transform again. At least one famous retailer at this week's event was among their number. So what were those principles? I'll give you a hint. Digital was not among them. In order of priority, they agreed the most important aspects were delivering value to our customers. So customer first then. Investing in our employees. Training, continuous learning. Dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers. Exploiting our extended networks. Supporting the communities in which we work. Giving back to those that support us. Looking back to my Toyota years and the founding principles of the Toyota production system, we see that they are not dissimilar to those same principles of customer first, respect for humanity, and elimination of waste, otherwise known as non-value added activity. So nothing new then. You sort of see where I'm going with this. We keep talking about transformation and innovation, but innovation means new ideas, and transformation means changing everything. To truly transform an organization means changing its design, its operating model, and the way you behave. Your organizations are designed in vertical hierarchical structures, often colloquially known or referred to as silos, that are sometimes jealously protected by the executives that lead them. 
They do not want anything to happen without their consent and will ensure they do not lose any power or control over them. And this behavior is often driven by company incentive schemes at odds with the delivery of customer value. The challenge with this is that value flows to your customers horizontally across an organization, which means that we need to remove the barriers to flow, and that means those silos. This means leaders need to be working together as a real team to achieve flow and not competing for bonuses and for control. Value rarely flows vertically and value is only valuable if someone values your value. That someone is the customer. Transformation is better described as organizational transformation the what, the why, and the how you transform into the right type of organization to meet the needs and desires of your customer. MIT are currently running courses for executives on digital transformation. And when reading the course, the crux of the course is getting rid of piles of legacy applications and then deciding whether, deciding whether to build it or buy it. Next, it's about recognizing that transforming is an organization is exactly that, an organizational transformation, not just an increase in IT spending. Using a simple but extremely powerful technique from Simon Wardley from the UK, you can solve that first problem rapidly. Want to know how to do that digital modernization? Then use this simple tool. In this simple real-life example, the large financial organization we ran this exercise with was proposing to spend over $100 million utilizing over 1,500 developers to build a huge factory of applications of part of their digital transformation. Here we see their long list of major initiatives. Budgets have been approved and the army of developers have been trained by me on how to use Scrum and other myth magical incantations to achieve this. Then we took a step back and asked why. We asked them to create a simple value chain and to rank the initiatives in order of value and visibility to their customers. Now remember, an actual customer is a source of revenue. They give you money, and while we love our internal stakeholders and our users dearly, they are generally a cost, not an income. So here we have 15 of the key initiatives for this 1500 plus strong workforce of outsourced vendor labor. Yes, think about that for a moment. The initiatives are ranked by value to those who give you money, the customer. Let's see what happens when we plot this on a Wardley map. A Wardley map is arranged on a simple X and Y axis. The y-axis maintains the visualization of visibility and value to the client. Can the client see and is it valuable to them? So here you see those initiatives and only one is directly connected to the customer, number seven. All the rest are either internal systems or systems that support other systems with no human interaction at all. Of course, we need systems so our customer support teams can provide our customers with improved levels of service assuming you aren't all intending to make everyone talk to some AI bot. Yes, that's right. Keep pressing numbers and never reach a human because we hate you so much. Now, looking along the x-axis, we can see four categories. Genesis, custom-built, product, and rental, all the way to the right where we see commodity and utility. Wow! We had 1,500 plus people gearing up to eat tens of millions of dollars on the equivalent of years of development. Let's go back to the MIT course on digital transformation and the advice is to outsource as much as makes sense and stop trying to do all this yourself. That's their advice. That does not mean staff augmentation. It means custom off-the-shelf packages, COTS packages and product rental. If you now look at our map, we see that we have only five of those 15 initiatives that should be managed in-house. Two in Genesis, which is R&D, and three in Customer Built, as there are no commercially available alternatives. The rest should be licensed as those COTS packages, and five rented as commodity. Cloud is a commodity, as are those 
as a service items. If you are serious about transforming your organization, then it's going to take a lot more than digital. So yes, digital is essential, but it's not transformative. It keeps you relevant, gives you access to valuable information more rapidly, and is an evolution of technology in the same way as we've moved on from pocket watches and vacuum tubes. But it will not magically transform you into a unicorn and have customers flocking to your products and services if those products and services are not relevant or the perception of your value is non-existent. I'll end with the words of Peter Drucker, the father of management. There is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. Thank you for listening. I hope some of this was useful despite my British sarcasm. And if you'd like to learn more about some of the techniques I covered, please join me at 1pm Central Time for a live discussion on the concepts covered and some ideas and tools to solve your complex problems and gain greater customer awareness. Thank you.